So we're now officially recording. So if anyone's here and they shouldn't be, it's your chance to get away from it right now. But uh, I'll hand you over to Pete and I'll let Pete give his own little introduction because he's got quite a cool backstory and a lot of ties to our lovely land here in Ireland. So Pete, take it away, pal. Right. Well, um, first thing I'm going to do is say, hey, Patrick, can you let me share my screen? Uh, yeah, you can. Just share screen at the bottom. You're the admin. Uh, it's telling me the host disabled participant screen sharing, so. Uh -oh. uh, good. Should have tested this one. No, one second. Hey, hey, everybody, so me. anyway, my name is Pete Whelan. I am a troublemaking individual, as a fair number of you are, are well aware. So I'm clicking over here. Yes, this is the one that I want to share. That one. Cool. And there we go. So, um, for those of you who don't know me, I am a software quality person testing uh, recovering developer. It's one of those things that I have to decide about every day. Am I going to write code today or not? Um, fortunately, it has been uh, about three months since I wrote any code. Um, so I think I'm doing quite well. Before that, I, it, it was, um, I wrote code almost every day for for several months, and then I had about two years without writing code. So, so it's it's a weird thing, but I'm very happy to say that it's been about three months since I actually intentionally wrote code. Um, but mostly, I do things around agile and testing and delivery and quality, and. I got to thinking about some things that there are some ideas that people tend to get upset with and other people tend to find troubling. And for lack of better judgment, I think, uh, I'm going to thank uh, Darren and Patrick for asking me to come in and do this, do, do this little talk. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm happy to see so many people joining in and engaged. I'm so happy to be in presenting out of my trusty home office. Um, so here we go. In the Dark Ages, sometime after the fall of Rome, we would have weird things happening when we tried to make software. And there would be a request that would be submitted to the keepers of such things. And upon due review and process management, there would be requirements come from that. And requirements would in turn create specifications and these specifications would be very detailed and very precise and specifications then gave us design and design was a very powerful tool that we could use to go and fully understand and there was always a linear relationship between requests to requirements to specifications to design and so you could see a point in the request and see the corresponding design point and say yes these two are definitely tied together and we'd had very complex convoluted uh, measuring and control models that said this is the way that it is and the same identifiers tied in there and then design of course begat two twins that always gave us two elements the first one was depending on the shop and depending on what you were writing it might be pseudocode or it might be coding sheets. If you were uh, writing an RPG or RPG2, you definitely wanted to use code sheets because it was extremely complex and hard to do um, to make sure that you were hammering the ones and zeros into those into the stone tablets that we used to write code on once upon a time. Uh, pseudocode, you could be a little bit more freeform. Um, and, and so that would be good. But that Again, you could go from those things up to design, up to specifications, and be able to show precise functions within the code, within the program that you were making to each request element. And you could say, yes, this section refers to this request. And that was always considered a terribly important thing. Uh, but the other twin, the one that we are concerned with right now, is this one, the test strategy, which always related to to again design and specifications and requirements. But even then you could pair 
what was being produced from the pseudocode or code sheets with the test strategy and see the relationship between the elements. And this is the way that it was and things were good because this is the way that it had to be. This is how you did all sorts of good things. So from the pseudocode and the coding sheets, you got the code, you got programs that would eventually be sent through a compiler and would be run at some point. The test strategy gave us other things. The test strategy begat, and some of the terms may flip around depending on what model you were using, uh, but the test strategy begat test plans. And test plans in themselves gave us things like scenarios and scripts and cases and steps. And each of these, again, could be tied back specifically to elements within the test strategy. And of course, the test strategy had to be linearly related to design, to specification, to the requirements. And so you could have this structure that did this. There were test teams that would be introduced to make sure that the code was right, to make sure that everything worked, to make sure that we were, oh, how should we say, we were adhering to requirements that, that the code was doing the right thing, that everything was awesome. And the cool part about it, and this is true, that I was a tester at, at one shop and they required us to wear this for a uniform so that people, we'd walk into the room and they go, oh good, the testers are here. Um, the barrel helmet aside, because the barrel helmet actually limited our vision a little bit, made it really, really hard to see the screen, but the black outfit and the big broadsword were awesome for doing things um, around you know, around testing. And it made the point to the developers that bad things might happen if there were issues. The problem, of course, if anybody else was doing this, um, if anybody else was was involved in this, would be that we became gatekeepers. None would pass. As long as we were the ones saying, this is what testing was. This is what quality was. This is what the purpose and the mission of this was. None would pass. We owned it. We were the ones that had absolute control over everything, which was awesome. We looked awesome. And everything was fantastic until something got through to production that shouldn't have. Then we tended to end up looking a bit like this because all of a sudden, all of our credibility was gone and we had nothing that we could point to and say, but, 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 because we tested exactly what we said we were going to test and we still messed it up. How could we possibly have messed it up? which brings us to talking about process. When we make process, we have to control things, right? That's why we've got a process model so that we can control what we're doing. There were always stage gates, checkpoints. Have we got this done? Yes. Have we got this done? No, then we cannot move to the next level until this is done. Now, that's not necessarily a big deal. If you're defining requirements and you're not yet done defining requirements, you cannot go on to design. That's just against nature to try and do something like that. And so we have to get all the requirements together and get everybody to agree what all the requirements mean, whether they're involved or participating in that requirement or not. Everybody has to agree what that means. And once that happens, then there would be papers to sign and formal ceremonies and people in very, very nice suits would be there discussing things. And then everybody would get a copy. And my first computer geek job, there were actually copies that would be passed around a table and people would sign in the appropriate spot on a printed copy of the documents. And we did that for every single document. We did that for the requirements document. We did that for the specifications. We did that for the design. We did that for uh, the, 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 um, the pseudocode and, and the code sheets. Yes, these are correct. 
please developer, please programmer, go write code from these. These are, these are what we expected to see. Yes, tester, you, we approve of your test strategy. This seems reasonable based on all these other documents. Now proceed with everything. And so you had that for every single instance, every single thing until something might happen where you found something that didn't quite line up. And then we had to have a variation. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you've ever had to get people who agreed on something to realize that, wait, there's an issue. Somebody may have possibly missed something. So let's talk about variation and let's, and let's come cap in hand and beg and plead and say, but please, sir, we've, because it was almost invariably a sir that we were approaching, please, sir, we found something that doesn't quite seem right to us. Does, does our, our humble assessment of what you're doing, does this seem reasonable? Because if this seems correct to you, then perhaps we might need to, to ask for a variable or a variation on this other document because we found we've got questions as we're making the test strategy or the test plan or something. That was always kind of a pain, but the good news is we always had a structure because structure is important. Everything has to be fixed in place so that we can do something else. Namely, we can be predictable. A formal structure like this rules made us predictable. We could have absolute predictability. We could tell people exactly when we would get to their part of the system when we were working on it, testing, writing, uh, developing, designing, whatever. The other thing was this kind of a process gave us stuff that was easily measured so we could make nice pie charts and have good celebrations and we could really appreciate the pizza at the end of each, at the end of each uh, stage gate sign off event. Um, we could show progress. We've got these number of things written, we've got these number of things done, we've got these number of other things that are still in progress, but look, we're making progress. We've always got this nice trend chart, making sure that my finger is going upward on camera is because you never know. And we can show progress. Look at how much we're getting done. We're setting a new record. No project has ever had this kind of a thing before. And of course we're going to find bugs and we can handle that because we can count them, we can measure them, we can show some level of prediction. I've got books on the bookshelf behind me that tell you very precisely how you can predict the number of bugs you're going to encounter based on the complexity and number of lines of code that, that you had to write. Carl, stop laughing. I can hear you all the way over here. The problem, of course, when we do this, we have been able to show all possible paths have been considered and evaluated and measured before we can do anything. And this is good because this gives us measurements and we could then safely define requirements because we knew exactly how to define requirements because we had these fully repeatable processes that we could follow that when we were looking for requirements. And so we could do all these good things. We could safely define the specifications of the design. We could safely write code. We could then celebrate success. And everybody who's been involved up to this point is going to have t-shirts handed out and pizza and and depending on where you are, you might have you might have Coca-Cola or you might have Pepsi or you might have beer. Beer is good, but for a time we could have beer in the office. But anyway, that's another story. Except everything magically took longer than we said that it would. Everything magically took longer than we thought. Because let's face it, sometimes defining requirements can be quite complex. And we can either say, okay, we, we've hit the timeline, therefore we're done, or we might push it out a few days. And then same thing happens with design. But it doesn't really matter because we can do that. And we'll just shorten the test phase because after all, we're being so thorough and so careful, we don't need to worry about that. 
right? I mean, that that's just makes perfect sense. Then we can have the big party, except when we have the really big party with not only pizza, but also cake, the testers are going to be doing stuff. I'm getting winked at by something. Okay, good. Um, so if we're doing this, we've got all these things, except the testers aren't actually in the room. The testers are off at their desks or in their labs doing things. And they're doing stuff that needs to be done. And so they're not in there having the cake and the pizza. And they're doing work and they're finding things that makes them say, excuse me, developer, but I found this issue and I wonder if you can take a look at it. And the response invariably was, no, 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 no. Don't, don't come to me with this. You must, must, must write them up in the defect management and tracking tool and submit it and refer to the, the design the design and spec and requirement elements that this is related to. And then it will be reviewed in the triage meeting on Monday. It's like, wait, today's Tuesday. Yes, but we review defects on Monday. That's the natural ordered way of doing things. We must do things on Monday. That's when we start our work. If you've ever been in an environment like that, that sounds really familiar. In 2011, Alberto Savoyo gave a very interesting keynote at GTAC, the, the, the Google conference. And he gave the opening keynote and was introduced by, um, by, by uh, uh, James Whitaker. And the title of the keynote is this, Test is Dead. Needless to say, it got a little attention. That was even, in 2011, that was even bigger clickbait than what the title of this topic is, of this presentation is. Um, and it was, he intended it as a wake-up call. I can, I can add that the link, the YouTube link uh, at, at the end here, but at the moment I've kind of got too many windows going and I'm not very good at multitasking. Um, but we've got test is dead. And he went out and made a talk and talked about it specifically to say things. I figure I can safely say these things. Most of the people here are Irish. They know exactly what I mean. But the question comes, how do we do these things? His talk was actually interesting. He talked about the problems doing the things that I've just described. And he gave some alternatives. I've got other alternatives that I would like to consider. The reason why I was thinking about this some time ago was because the stuff that in 2011, Savoyo was saying, this stuff has to die. It needs to be gone. There's loads of companies still doing it. Loads of companies still testing in exactly the same way. We have a requirement, therefore we've got a test case around that requirement. We've got very specific steps and each step goes and relates directly to something within that requirement. And what I've found the last five years, 10 years, is that a lot of people really like it. They're comfortable with it. It is a good for them. They like this feeling because I don't know why, but I've got my own suspicions. But people really like it. Companies really like it. Test managers, I found, really, really like it. And this, I think, gets down to part of the thing. Test managers really like it. The people that work for those test managers like it, partly because that's what they get told to do. It's easy to do. But the question is why? 
What I've found is that for the most part, things are easy to measure. They're easy to track. We can count the test cases and say, this is what we've got left. This is what we've executed. This is what we've done. These are how many have passed. These are how many have failed. These are what we're pending review on. Actually, I just had a client who actually counted test steps and they would measure progress per day by the number of test steps executed. I think that, I think they were kind of the catalyst for me, but anyway, but it made things easy to measure and track. We could track progress that way. We could show problems. We could show defects. We could do all sorts of things. The most important thing though, I think for, for at least some of these managers and project managers and, and people who called themselves scrum masters was, it was really, really easy to make nice pie charts so they can show progress and nice charts to their upper management. I'm not entirely certain if that's the only reason. And some people I think might be screaming at me. I'm kind of ignoring what the chat window says right now, mostly because I can't see it. But anyway, um, there we are. So my question then becomes, that tells us something, doesn't it? Ah, uh, yes. What it's telling us is something important and that the testing that people talk about, this is not dead. Now, I understand I've worked in regulated environments as well. I understand that, that in some instances, this is very important. People's life and limb are depending on our testing. There's going to be controls and measures that exist that don't exist in other places, except that the other places they do exist. An awful lot of people have things in there and an awful lot of people do things because the cool companies do them, which I think is part of the reason why, why you, you see so many people talking about agile and now DevOps because the cool companies are doing them. Therefore we must be a cool company, but when it comes to testing, they have not progressed one iota. They have not moved at all. So I'm going to gently suggest something. Instead of having these heavy handed structures without variation or any kind of variation is bad. Predictability is, is, it, it, is the gold standard. We must be able to show this is precisely what we have. This is precisely what we enter. This is what the value is on the screen. These are the results when you enter this value in this field and click this button. What if we did something else entirely? Now, I'm, I'm suspecting that there are people who are probably screaming um, that, but Pete, you don't seem to understand. And it's like, I do understand. Because when, now that everybody has gone agile, because that's what the cool companies are doing. This form of testing is really, really slow. So what's the solution? We're going to sit down and we're going to write code that re replicates the manual steps of doing that, which means that this field we presume is going to have this name precisely. And this field is going to have this name precisely. And the values that we can enter are these precise things and they tie back to this field in the database. And so we're going to do this and we can going to do this and we're going to do this. And we've got all this stuff that works except it doesn't always work. A lot of times, at the very beginning, it doesn't work. But we're so locked into it that we can't say, hold on, something isn't quite right. So what if we did something else entirely? What if we try something that I like to call conversation, which I hope to have in just a very few minutes? People talking, people working together, collaboration, people engaged in 
in an exchange of ideas, which if you're really going to exchange ideas and have true conversation with luck, you're going to have some form of communication. Now, a lot of organizations and maybe yours, if, and if yours is included in there, I'm terribly sorry, but a lot of organizations think of communication as writing a document. And the bigger and thicker the document, the more pages, the better the communication is. That's not communication. Um, the issue is, in my mind, we don't understand what communication is. And because we don't understand communication, we don't understand what collaboration and conversation actually look like. Communication isn't me talking to you. Communication is me making sure you understand what I am what I'm trying to say, what my, what my motives are, what my goal is, what I'm hoping you will hear and hear it in a way that you can take it in and consider it carefully. Because when we do that, we can learn from each other. This then gives us the opportunity for everybody to jump in and learn as equals. So when somebody doing testing work finds a defect. They don't need to come cap in hand very humbly and say, excuse me, Mr. Developer, I know that I'm only a testing person, but, but please, I found something that looks unusual and I think it might be a bug. Please, sir, can you, because again, most of the time when I've had people insist this is the way it is, it's been sir. Um, please, sir, will you consider allowing me a few moments of your very precious time to tell me what I should have done differently because obviously I didn't understand. That needs to go away. Many organizations, that's still there. What if instead we tried something else entirely? We drop the buzzwords. We don't worry so much about what, what, what the standard and by this, I mean quite literally, what the ISO standard calls something. We don't worry about what ISTQB refers to something as. We don't worry about the people uh, advocating context-driven uh, testing advocate. We drop the buzzwords, all of them, every single one. I'm not even going to give you another list of buzzwords to replace them with, but just get rid of them. Focus on the reason for the project. Why are we doing this? What is the point of the work that we're engaged in? Why are we making this change? Why are we making this new piece of software? That's the focus. We sit down, we roll up our sleeves as equals and discuss this. We find an understanding. We have to communicate. We do real actual communication and everyone can focus on the real reason. We don't need to worry about filling out forms. We don't need to worry about documenting things. We need to be able to understand. We need to not check boxes. And I mean that quite literally. I did, uh, uh, before, I, before I went to work for Salesforce quite a few years ago, um, I actually had two clients who actually had checklists that I was, work, that I was working with them. And one of them, I was quite successful. I was quite glad that they got rid of the check boxes, but they, they literally had, had this requirement statement ties to this design, this line in the design document, and eventually got all the way down to the test steps. So does every test step relate to a requirement? Yes, good, check. Does every test step relate to a design element? Well, if it relates to a requirement, a requirement it should, right? So check. Can we do all these things and make everything happen? Check. Good. Then that's what good testing was. Except it's, they still had production problems. They still had huge problems. Ignoring the checkbox was the first step. What helped after that was the testers helping the developers, helping them understand what testing is, how they could do better unit testing, <gasps> unit testing. They, call, they, they were extremely waterfall. The idea of adopting uh, TDD, well, they were extremely what they called waterfall. The idea of doing anything TDD or even potentially agile-ish 
was anathema. They would be they were not going to hear it because that's just a waste of time. But testers helping developers understand how it, how they approach testing and maybe exchange ideas on, on unit testing. What kind of tests would the testers be running right away? And then sharing that with the developers so the developers could do it and avoid the in, avoid the thrash of, of, okay, here's a build. Oh, no, nope, there's a problem. Okay, here's a build. You know, next day, I found another problem. If the developers had that list of items, then maybe we could get things done faster. At the same time, the developers turn around and help the testers. Here are the problems that we have. Now, I don't expect by that that, that the testers need to become as good at writing code as the developers are. That's silly. You're not going to do that in a few weeks, no matter how hard you try. But you can understand the problems. You can understand the complexities that the developers face, and that can help inform your testing. But the idea is everyone learns and improves. Everyone gets better at their chosen specialty. Therefore, when I said before about throwing away the buzzwords, throwing away the th th throwing away everything, I also mean the definition that people use for software testing. And I kind of lied when I said I wouldn't give you any more buzzwords because this, when people ask me what software testing is, this is what I use. It's a systematic evaluation of the behavior of a piece of software on a model. If we are trying to get an understanding of how a system behaves under load, that's our model. We're going to do some load testing or performance testing. We're going to do some other things. If we're going to uh, um, look at different elements within that, we're going. if we're going to look at certain business needs, that becomes our model. If we're going to be using different personas, that becomes a model. If in, And by that, I mean, literally, we're going to use a persona. We're not going to use as a, uh, as a, as a customer, I want to do this. No, because everybody's different. Everybody will use the software differently. No two people can use the same piece of software, identically the same. Each one of those mindsets is a model. The idea that what we had in the past, this controlled ISO driven testing, Ah, Carl, what are some hypotheses as to the antiquated approach to SDLC? Okay, Carl, I will discuss that in a moment. But the question that I have, because I'm really close to, to the end of the slides, I promise. Um, the idea of what we had for testing in order to improve in order to test faster, to deliver better quality faster. Because that's really what we're in this for. We're really here to go and deliver the best quality software that we possibly can in as short a timeline as we can so that people can understand what it is that the software does. These are the things that we're driving towards, right? We must change how we think about testing. We must change how we approach testing. And I don't mean, oh, automate everything. Because if you go back to automating the checkboxes, you haven't improved. You've just made bad faster. So the old testing must go away. It must go the way of the dodo bird. It must be gone. If you don't want to change, you're going to have serious issues. What we must do is replace it with testing that actually works. And the issue that I see is, but we need a model for that. We need a template. Maybe. But that template should be specific. That model should be precisely what your organization needs. If you, take, if you take it from one spot and drop it into another, 
like a cookie cutter or a cookbook, you probably are not going to get the kind of testing that you actually need. You need to find something that works for you. That's really your key. You can do that or you can rely on something different, which is essentially what most organizations are doing. You can continue now to rely on the all-powerful Tim. Right, that is the end of the official slides. Um, that's my contact information. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I don't think too many people um, have dropped off. So I'm going to leave that up there for now. Let's talk. We actually gained a few actually, Pete, so that's a good sign instead of losing people during the talk. Oh yeah, hey, I'll take that, positive. yeah. That's a real positive. Uh, first of all, yeah, thanks a million for that. A huge virtual vote of from everyone silent and listening. Uh, we have a good few minutes time for questions anyway. There's plenty of chat going on in the chat box anyway, and a few questions starting to pop in. So anyone has any questions at all, now is a very good time to fire them into the Q&A box or raise your hand, and we can get to them now and people get through as many as you can. So, okay. I'm going to jump in and say Carl entered one of the Q&A box, yeah. and, and I'll catch up with, with, with the other stuff in the chat is, cool. is, and unless, unless somebody wants to drop it in there or point me to something more specific. Okay, what are some of the hypotheses as to why the antiquated approach is still thought is the best way to do things? And the answer to that, Carl, as you and I have discussed more than once, is there's too much money in it. We are looking at at um, people who have built their livelihoods around this. And they've got too much invested in the idea of something different happening. They find horrifying. They find to be absolutely terrifying because they might lose control. Because if they lose control, they're going to have a problem. And the problem is they're not going to be able to laugh all the way to the bank and tell people they're the only ones who know what the answer really is. That is my, my, my unfiltered opinion. And, and when people say, but, but what about this? And it's like, the, the, the idea of, of, of that is you can see it um, for those of you who don't know, I'm in, I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan in the States. Um, we've had a, we, we've had a, uh, two days of, of curfew, um, ending tonight. I think I haven't actually seen an official announcement changing it because of protests going on, um, in the street. There were some, uh, there were some interesting questions about things that people didn't like very much. And there were some people who were, who, who were, um, um, have been outed. It's funny because what, what one of the people who was running around starting smashing windows and things and setting police cruisers on fire, uh, and, and, and putting a brick through one of my favorite restaurants downtown, um, um, was actually outed by a colleague of mine in GR testers and in my local meetup um, as he was because the restaurant that was being smashed was on the ground floor level of the building that he lived in and so he took this very personally and did some did some good testing work and said hey I found these trends and he identified the person I mean within about a 90% thing and notified authorities and they said dude, you did this faster than we did. He said, I'm a tester. Um, so there we have it. Um, we need to be able to look at things differently because when things are looking at being threatened, people will react strongly. And the, why people are not wanting to let go is because they are feeling threatened. Now, um, I hope that I... Carl, I, I hope that addressed that. Now, Dave, um, oh, thank you for the comment. Uh, yeah, the, the, the buzzword thing. Um, yeah, Alan Page and I agree on a lot of things. Um, his, uh, he, he and I have got similar worldviews. Um, we don't agree on everything, but yeah, he, his idea of modern testing is not that far 
different than some of the things that I've been pushing uh, for some time. And is in in Lisa and I. Um, I've both presented at a couple of Agile conferences, including the one where I met Darren, uh, I won't say how many years ago, um, but that's part of it. It, it. By using plain language um, to talk about testing, using language that people understand and people know already, by not trying to redefine things, we could like, um, we, 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 we can make this happen and we can make this a thing so that people will, will share understanding and will actually be able to, to do work around that. Does that make sense? Dave, if you can chime in, if you want more. Second. There you go. Okay. Um, Thank you. I, I'm here. So <laughs> thanks for this opportunity to, talk, to address the speaker. Uh, I just, I, Based on what you said, I kind of take it as modern testing applied for the masses. You know, the masses being our our cohort. But you know, it, just hearing hearing that you and Alan have a uh, close alignment on on approaches or you know thinking, um, I think that kind of addresses the point I was trying to raise. So thank you again. Yeah. Well, and, and what's interesting is that uh, uh, the the paper that I wrote that this is loosely based on. Um, <laughs> I don't think he, I, I think he thinks we're not in that close of alignment, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's another story. Um, yeah, if that's it, so we've got anonymous attendee. Uh, I'm just going through this in, in sequence. Um, yeah, Patrick, perfect. Or something. Yeah. No, that's okay. okay, how to switch to new reality. Okay, where am I? Uh, with dead testing in case you are manual QA. Oh, excellent question. Um, I don't think about things as manual in QA. I would, I think of manual QA or, or any other kind of QA because we are testers and, and the goal is to say, how do we approach testing in the first place? And that is probably it. I'm going to see if I can, uh, uh, I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I don't think yeah, it's done. It's done. Yeah, you're on the big screen now. Oh, you killed it. I'm on the big screen. Okay, good. So I'm just going to quit the presentation so that yeah. I can uh, so, so that I can pull pull the screen up in slideshow. Boom, done. Okay, pulling you up here. Okay, excellent. So I can pull this up here. Good, excellent. Now I can feel like like I'm not jumping back and forth <laughs> because I get very dizzy. I'm old. You don't want to get. Yeah, that's bad. Okay, so here we are. Um, if you think about what makes good testing, what is it that you put into testing that makes that makes that important. That in my mind is the new reality that, that testing so that you're adding value, testing so that you can drive answers. Um, you're still doing testing. It doesn't matter if you are automated or, or, or manual or some weird hybrid, but the goal is to make things better. You add value by addressing the purpose of what the software is. If you can go to your boss, if you can go to your management and say, or team lead, or depending on the kind of organization you're in, if you can go to them and say, look, can we try something different? What if I sit down and work with, work with the developers, work with, work, work with some of the developers, and so that I understand better what they're doing, and I can draw this out. Um, one, of the, one of the tools that I was doing uh, a, couple of, a couple of engagements ago is I actually sat down and introduced them to the idea of mind maps so that I could show things and say, these are, these are what we're trying to do. Because we were both looking at uh, the developer that was lead on the project and I were both looking at the same set of documents going, this makes no sense. And so we tried going mapping things out so that we could say, ah, this must be what this is. And we could take, take this model, this map and go back to people and say, this is our understanding. Does this match? Now what we were actually doing was testing the requirements. We were testing the, the, in this, in this case, it was a weird mix of, of uh, requirements and user story. Is this doing what we think we're doing? Okay. So if you can do that, your career path might mean a different company which is scary, especially right now. But these are things that you can learn. Okay, does that make sense? 
Well, we can't get followed because it's anonymous, but yeah, we're hopefully that makes That's anonymous. Okay. I'm hoping uh, anonymous, otherwise chime in and, and, the, and the chat and I'll try and follow up in a bit. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. Andreas. Hello, Andreas. Uh, if the old ways of testing perpetuate for another 10 years or so, wouldn't it be sorted by nature? No, not necessarily. Because the question is, um, you'd be surprised how many companies are actually doing that without admitting that they're doing it. Um, there are some very large organizations that are pretending, just like there are very large organizations pretending to be agile, they're going through the motions. And so now their project managers are scrum masters. They're, they're, uh, they, they're doing things around sprints and iterations, but somehow they're doing them so that they align with their, with their three times a year release schedule. And so nothing is ever actually getting released except for three times a year. They're just going through the rituals and calling themselves agile. They're not actually improving anything. And so uh, it's a bit depressing. Um, it's a bit depressing to think of that in, in reality, but um, I would hope that in time they would go away. Um, but I'm not sure that it will. Darwin wasn't always right. Okay. Because um, it seems to me like a rolling rock upwards the hill all the time. It's kind of energy consuming what you're saying. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, I, I th a colleague of mine did, did a, uh, and his name will come to me, but I'm sure about 10 minutes after we end. There, I've done with my hard work. There, see our hosts are drinking beer. Now I've got a beer open. Yes, it's just past one o'clock here. Cheers, Pete. Where I'm, it's long yeah. time. <laughs> um, but uh, he referred to, he referred to changing testing practices as a Sisyphean task. Uh, Sisyphus, from I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, from Greek mythology, uh, was found in Hades, the land land of the land of the dead, kingdom of the dead. He, his goal was to roll a big, huge rock up to the top of a mountain. And every time he got close to the top, it would roll back down. So he was doing the same thing over and over again. That's essentially what this can be. It depends on how you approach it, and it depends a great deal. And how do you, how do you, convince your bosses that this is really important? And it goes back to the question of conversation. And and I've said it, I think before to to anonymous um, that sometimes the best way to change your organization is to change your organization. Thank you. Okay. Margaret is my grandmother's name. In terms of communication, how can we find the balance between the, I will write the almighty document approach and constant meetings? Ah, Margaret, do you drink coffee or tea? Um, I'd say I'm more of a coffee person, but that depends on the time of the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had, my solution to that was to literally grab a cup of coffee and, and offer to buy people coffee and donuts or bagels or something, some snack and sit down and just have a conversation. Say, hi, I know that we need to document this, but I need to make sure that, that we've got an understanding. Before, before, before pen meets paper, before fingers meet keyboard, that way you've already begun to establish a relationship. And that is the beginning. Um, how it goes beyond that, I can't tell you, but that is where I always began. And each time that I've done that, it took a different path. It took a different route. And, but yeah, that, that's a really important question. It's really, really hard. And it's the kind of thing that a lot of organizations will frown on because they'll say, no, we must do this because this is the best practice until you can show them something that's better. <laughs> okay, I'll take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, in Agile, we don't have too much documentation. Oh, that's a bold statement. We do testing per story. Ideally, yes. Um, how could we still improve coverage in modern testing as we can't test everything? Um, that depends. 
if you, it depends a great deal on your context. It depends a great deal on your organization and how you approach things. If you are testing, if the only person doing testing of the executable code is the tester in the team or the test team, and they are only testing at the end, I don't know how agile you actually are. And I don't mean to cause offense. I hope that I'm not causing offense, but the simple fact is if you are waiting for somebody to do testing, you are slowing down delivery, period. And with that, I'm putting on my official IMA certified Scrum Master through the Scrum Alliance. I've also taught software testing. And in the, there was a time, although it's been a while, that, that, that I, I was teaching the black box software testing course um, developed by Dr. Kim Kaner. But this is crucial. How do we do testing per story? Well, that depends. If you are going to be doing that, I suggest that it become a partnership. It become as collaborative as it possibly can. And when it comes to improving coverage, do you really need to improve coverage? What's really done? How many times is a given path through a code executed? How many times is it used? Do you actually need to worry about that? Or can, your, can you build some uh, 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 tests that can be run, for example, through a regression suite or through a CI environment and run that through? I don't know your particular situation, but that that is typically how I how I approach it is to make sure that that we've got happy path smoke tests that we can run through. We can develop code, execute it, pound it through, and say yes, this is what we have, and then I can focus on the important stuff. Then I can turn around and focus. And, and by the way, this is exactly what I was doing when I was working at Salesforce. And when I was working for the sale, uh, marketing cloud at Salesforce, I wrote a bunch of scripts uh, using PowerShell that would execute all the really important stuff that we knew had to work every single time. And then I could focus on the things that were going to change per story, per iteration, and make that happen. Okay, does that make sense? I hope, I hope I'm explaining this clearly. You're muted there. I assume, I assume it's Manji. Is M. Kelsey, if you want to add anything to Manji, or if not, that's great. You can go to the next one. I, no. I think that's fine. I think what you said to me, um, uh, time to time, we cannot cover everything because uh, we have got too many edge, edge cases. And uh, edge cases are very important. And so testing takes very longer. And sometimes we cannot do all the coverage. Yes, I agree. Um, if they are fixed edge cases, for example, if they are part of the structure of the application itself, or if they are edge cases being introduced uh, in a given sprint, those are two different considerations. If I, can, if I can figure out what the edge cases are, execute them manually, come up with a path that it will actually cover them, I can then turn around and either I write code myself or I have a conversation with a developer colleague and say, hey, here's some tests that I need covered. Can you write them for me? Or here's what the, here's what the gain is to the organization. If that helps, you know, that, that, that's what I've done. Oh, and then what happens then is that that code that got written then gets included into either the regression test or depending on the structure that you're working in, it gets included into your CI build. So that each time somebody checks in, boom, that's going to get fired off and that's going to get tested. Okay, I hope that helps. Okay, Kishore. Industry thinks everything can be automated so they can fire testers after a while. Oh, yes. That sounds like another meetup for now. <laughs> that's an excellent topic. Um, can, I, can I plug an article that I wrote? I just need to find it. Um, I'll drop it into chat as soon as I pull the thing up and ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. and actually my local testing, uh, testing group, uh, actually had this as, actually had this as a conversation. So it's like, Whoa, check this out. Um, oh, it hasn't been published yet, so I can't plug it yet. Okay. But, uh, there's a piece that I just wrote that gets published next week. I just realized because I'm getting old and senile and I, 
and I've forgotten my calendar. Um, we can share it out after you, next weekend if you like. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it out there. But uh, but it's on the Ranorex uh, blog. I, I, I write write a write a piece oh every once in a while for for the folks at Ranorex for their testing tool company blog, um, and I talk specifically about the missing test automation skill. And the test automation skill that I believe is missing in most organizations is the concept of what is testing. That they, there's a great deal of focus on uh, on writing code, on understanding tools, on understanding Git, GitHub, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but not a whole lot of understanding around what makes a good test or how do we apply testing. Um, when I do talk about automated testing or test automation, I use that as um, as I do this to free myself up from the mundane so that I can focus on the new things, so that I can focus on what's coming in. And again, if you're, if you're working in, a, in an agile or agile-like environment, if you're doing all the testing at the end, there's a problem. Um, if they do need code written, if they if they are insisting that to be uh, definition of done, for example, which I have issues with, but I'm being polite. Um, if the definition of done requires that you have specific automated tests around something, uh, around a story, fine. Make sure that while the developers are writing that code, you are beginning to work on the automation code that will exercise that. And the best way that I have found to do that from just personal experience is to work with the developers as closely as I can. Now, what makes it curious is that uh, uh, last time, well, the first time that I tried to, that I tried this, my desk was four hours away from where the development team was. Um, and that was fun because because it led to a whole lot of a whole lot of conferences and so when I was in the office it built it, it required a great deal of uh, of uh, team building rapport building of me sitting down and gaining their trust so that they could see what I was doing and then me working with them so that between us we could figure out how could I possibly test and one of the things that we approached that was uh, was t was was a test first kind of idea um, not quite TDD but close to that um, because remember TDD is not a testing approach it's a development approach what you get at the end of TDD is a set of unit tests um, but that might inform us and how we're going to inform or how we're going to go and build uh, an automated suite um, if that's if that's a requirement for the organization, I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I'm just going to I'm going to I'm going to jump in there real quick. Oh yeah, I can, please, because I can. <laughs> Somebody gave me control of my own microphone. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> <laughs> what, Go ahead, what I'm going to drink. What I'd say is yeah, yeah, drink, drink. What I'd say is you can become you can become a just to add on to Pete's point, you can become a test coach, right? I mean. I'm kind of pushing this as a, as a, as a, as a career path because nobody seems to know what it is. But uh, that, that involves, you know, teaching the team how to test, teaching the developers how to think about testing. And then even if you want to, like, if they're starting to do test-driven development, which is cool, you can do acceptance test-driven development and you can introduce behavioral-driven development and all these kind of, all these kind of tools that, that, are, that are in your power to to help the team become better at testing, you know? So you can turn developers into testers and developers and testers can become developers. You know, it's kind of, once the roles start blurring a little bit, it becomes it becomes really fun and exciting. If that makes any sense here. Cool. Okay, as I'm quickly typing a response, I saw Igor's comment in the chat, so I'm responding to that. Um, I'm going to take things a little bit out of out of turn and say, hey, um, yeah, the, the thing about giants and software or whatever, uh, making making references to that. Remember that uh, that Alan Alan Page, who was referenced a few minutes ago, um, is a recovering Microsoft person. Um, his uh, uh, he and I had a great deal of fun. Uh, Quite a few years ago at a conference is as he was saying automate everything that makes sense and people said no we have to automate everything and he says only if that makes sense uh, 
And so, so at one point it was, it was the two of us arguing with a room full of about 30 people who said, no, 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 we have to automate everything. And it's like, good luck with that. Okay. So that I think is, is uh, uh, maybe wraps that question. Okay. So um, if I can jump up to Robert with the codeless automated test tools become the next big thing so companies can automate cheaper. I'm not sure what it, what it is that a codeless automated test tool is or if one actually exists. I know most people point to Cucumber, except that's not actually codeless, is it? That's, that's a shell that's going and building code and it may not necessarily get you what you think you're using. And I'm not entirely certain that that is going to get you uh, the, the, test out, the, the manageable test out that you think it's getting. It is, however, extremely useful uh, during design work so that you can share ideas and concepts with uh, with, uh, for example, business analysts okay. and things like that. Hey, Peter. Yep. This is Roberts. Um, yeah, yeah, I noticed in a couple of links that came up on my LinkedIn, there was companies promoting these codeless automated test tools. And probably the easiest way to describe what it does would be if you went to Wix.com and you wanted to make your website no coding needed, drag and drop. And these new companies are going down that path. They're taking the click and record that kind of failed 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. but they're bringing that with a lot more quality code behind it to actually make it work. I don't know where they're selling it at snake oil to say, hey, don't bring in those guys on 70 grand a year. Just get your manual guys, give them the, the, the click and drag and be able to do them. I don't know where the software is actually there yet. It was actually new to me that this codeless automation tools have been a thing. I just wondered if you'd seen them or maybe had any experience. Yeah, I've, I've played with a couple and there's one that I can say this one I think might deliver what it thinks or promises if I can, if I can deliver this this almost, I don't want to, I don't want to call it a plug, but, but it is one thing that I've seen that sort of works. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, uh, I can't think of the name now. Uh, I think it's project seven. Um, I did an evaluation. I did a tool evaluation for them in February and they're in the process of, of making, uh, of rolling that out that their latest version. And that actually looks interesting. The others that I've seen have been mostly smoke and mirrors. Um, yeah. But again, to call it codeless means simply that the person who's trying to go and develop the automation, the, the test, isn't writing code. But it's like a code generator from the bad old days, and by that I mean the late 80s, um, where the, there is code, there has to be code, that's what executes, but it's not necessarily the best code. Yeah. And so, so if you get somebody who is non-technical, although I'm not quite sure what that means anymore, um, they can come up with, with some form of, of automation stuff and then turn around and then have somebody who's, I uh, should say, more experienced or more advanced or, or a deeper understanding of the internal, internal workings. And they can dive in and take a look and make things happen in a way, you know, tweak it, improve it, whatever. Yeah, and so that's probably the best that I've seen. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Thanks for the question. It was actually a really good question. Oh, okay. Oh. Don't tell him. Don't tell Rob that his head's big enough as it is. <laughs> <laughs> I've just used that quote from my LinkedIn. Um, it's okay, Derek. I mean, you, sometimes you know you can tell, right? When when you you do this often enough, you just got to know when to say that was a really good question. But Robert's going to hate me forever. <laughs> Some, literally like someone doing a gig going, this is the best crowd I've ever had. Dublin, Minnesota, New York, wherever you are, you're the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh oh Wait, did Lisa drop off? Oh, no. Lisa, she went to the dentist. I can think of a whole lot better things to do on a, on a two than go to the dentist. Uh, she's in the... She's in the same time zone I am, so good luck, Lisa. Jeez. <laughs> um, okay, Vic's question. I think this is the last one in the Q&A. 
Uh, some of these changes require huge cultural changes. Yep, they do. No argument from me. Absolutely. Um, how do you accomplish it? And not to be culturally insensitive, but my dear lady wife introduced this to me uh, quite a few years ago. And that's the same way you eat an elephant, one bite at a time. Although my answer to that question is, how do, you, how do you eat an elephant? I prefer a knife and fork, because if you try and take big bites, the elephant will tend to kick you. Um, so the, I'm being very politically incorrect. I'm sorry if there's, if there's anyone out there that if, that's offended by that. I'm sorry. Not really. Uh, <laughs> okay, so yes, it does require huge cultural changes. How do you accomplish it? Um, Here's what I found to work. Start with your team. Start with the people that you work immediately with. And say, I have an experiment I want to try. See what you think. Can we try this? And once you've got people at least willing to try and you do it, you can show what the results are. And once, and once you've done that, then we get to the hard part of saying, Okay, we, I think we've got this kind of stuff happening. And this is an interesting point to consider. How can we make this better? And you do a few spins around, whoops, there we go, a few spins around and make things to the point where everybody on your team is comfortable. And then you can bring it up one level of management, say, hey, we've been trying this experiment. What do you, what do you think? Is there another team that might be interested or willing to try it. And by small bites, by small chunks, small pieces, that might help. Okay, that's probably the best suggestion that I have for that. One, one thing I've noticed, when you do stuff like that, you start doing it on one team and the team starts having fun and the team is working differently to the rest of the floor. Yeah. The rest of the floor starts kind of going, what are they doing over there? Why are they doing stuff differently? Why are they having more fun than me in work? And it kind of bleeds out like slowly, you know, so you roll it out in a second team and then maybe it's a third team and each team then starts slightly working differently. But the important thing is everyone's starting to enjoy their job a bit more, you know, yeah. so find that, that kind of happens. Also, yeah. uh, that, that was the last Look. question there. There's one in the chat that didn't make it over. I didn't see. And um, yeah, let me, where is it? Yeah, it's a good one as well. It's from Sharon O'Boyle and it says, any advice on how do you deal with a manager who wants to control everything, selectively communicates and is blocking collaboration by the way they manage people on the team separately? Um, Sharon, where are you located? Are, is Sharon in Ireland? Ten seconds. Yeah, I'm now Sharon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Thanks. I'm in Ireland, yes. <laughs> oh, where in Ireland? In the West, in Galway. Oh, Galway. I love Galway. I lived there for, for six months when I was a university student. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I, I was in the extreme West, and at, the, at that time, I was, in a, I was in a small village that consisted of 30 people, and we used to kind of laughingly make jokes and say, when the wind blew and, the, and it rained, you lost the lights. <laughs> People thought I was kidding. It's like no, actually, that pretty much every time, every time the wind blew and and it rained, you lost the lights. Pretty much, and if you've ever been to the extreme west, like Renville, yes, that's daily. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. It is. Actually, um, we're having fantastic weather at the moment, though. It's like a heat wave, so yeah. it's like Costa del Galway at the moment. There's, there's not a better place on earth than sunny than Galway. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay, I'm trying to behave. Right. So you're in Galway. Um, so that changes my answer a little bit. Um, and at the risk of this might get me in trouble internationally, there's always a solution that's just not polite. Um, if, that, if your manager is being a jerk, to be very American about it, um, I'm not quite entirely certain what you can do if they've got the backing of their leadership. Mm -hmm. um, what I have done 
is done things in spite of them. Yeah, I was thinking of that. Ask for forgiveness instead of permission sort of thing. Oh, no, I, I've never asked for forgiveness of those clowns. <laughs> um, okay, I, sh I should tell you that, that my mother's family came from Wexford, so uh, there's that. My father's family came from Poland, and so we kind of, it's like anybody kind of comes in and tells us how we're supposed to live, we kind of go, mm, yeah, yeah, no. Um, there, I, that was quick, so hopefully you can edit that out, right, Patrick? Uh, <laughs> That, 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 that might make the cause. So we'll see tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the question becomes, how do you get around them? And for that, I found, look, this works. If you don't like it, find something that works better because what you're doing doesn't work. However, having said that, I found that to be a useful card to play if you've got something else in the works yourself. Yeah. Because otherwise they make a bad and fire you. Um, kind of like the job that I had quite a few years ago where, where the development manager was in my office pounding on my desk. I was the test lead. They didn't have a test manager. I was as close as they had demanding to know how, the, how come the test group didn't find this bug in the testing environment. My response was, how come, the, why did the development team put it there? Um, harsh had pretty much all the testers laughing hysterically. Um, I was looking for a job in a couple of months, but that's okay. It, got, it was good to get that one out. So um, short of that, or maybe in addition to that, if you were in the States, uh, I might suggest um, um, arranging an accident. No, that, that's bad. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm not supposed to say that. I could see Darren just, just screaming, Pete, you can't say that. Um, I don't have a filter, Pete. You can say what you like. <laughs> I'm the worst person. <laughs> um, yeah, when the manager's an issue, the question becomes, how does he? how is that manager perceived by the rest of the organization? Not the rank and file individual contributors. How is it, how is that manager perceived by the uh, by the rest of management? Um, because I had a manager like that for a while, um, and I now refer to it as the Mike rule, <clears throat> which is nothing to do with the Stephen rule. Because I've had crappy managers. One was named Mike. One was named Stephen. They're similar, but they've got different rules. And so I've, from now on, pretty much I've made a rule to not get a job where the manager is going to be named Mike or Stephen. Um, so uh, Sharon, I don't think that's helping very much because I don't have a good answer for you. But that's as close as I'm going to get to, to coming up with, with a natural response that they could say, oh, do this and it'll fix it because I don't think there is a way to fix it. Mm. I think that's something I hear quite a lot, Sharon, actually, people are moving jobs, to be honest, as in people want to change, but sometimes the hierarchy above them don't, aren't susceptible to the change or they don't want to listen. Sometimes it can be a case of educating them as well. They may not understand the change. It could be a case of if you're trying to implement something new, your manager could be quite set in his or her ways and not, not understand the benefits. And obviously, from a team perspective, if you can show the benefits of it, that's going to help your cause. Or as Pete said, sometimes, unfortunately, there's just, there can be a clash from personality wise or, you know, which way you think you should be working as well. And that's quite a common uh, trait of why people actually sometimes either move into a new job or move location or whatever it is as well. Or sometimes manager moves as well, like from a business perspective, if you, if you can show the business it's worthwhile, obviously if it makes you more productive, obviously if it makes them money is always the main thing uh, from increasing your output as well. It makes, it makes your proposition more attractive from a business side as well. And sometimes it can be a case of, maybe speaking to other people in the business as well, not just the, maybe the direct person above you as well. Yeah, I, I think that is kind of the way I'm thinking at the moment. I'm thinking of going more to senior technical people, bypassing, yeah. it kind of a parallel path, it's not exactly bypassing. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a case of either you're going directly behind the background either. You're not trying to cause enemies. Like it's literally like, I just come with an idea maybe that's maybe not susceptible here. What do you think about this? And in fairness, if you get slapped down two or three times the exact same time, you're probably gonna get an idea where you're, where this is gonna go anyway. Or if you go to somebody else and they think, okay, cool, that's a really good idea. They might, the, the manager might be more susceptible to talk to them about it. And that's nothing on your part, but just sometimes they might think, okay, cool. If somebody above them has come to the job, come with them with the idea as well, they're probably going to listen more. 
to yeah. be honest, the, the, reason, the reason there's so many good managers in Ireland is because they do listen to people. And we get that from doing workshops and, and speaking to people every day of the week. The managers that keep their staff happiest, that keep the retain their staff and also manage to hire the best people are the managers that are open to change. If you're somebody that's no matter what work or life you're in, if you're a manager that's sitting there and saying, no, this is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. This is how it's always going to be. You're pissing against the wall. Like if you're a manager who says, yeah, this is how we did do it. What's your idea? Could this actually increase our productivity? Could it increase the revenue? Could it make our staff more happy? If it ticks any of them three boxes, what kind of crazy person would not want to at least listen to the proposal? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, 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 this is the first manager of work. This is the first time I've been in this situation, I guess. I, I've yeah. changed to a few different managers and I've never experienced it like this before. So, yeah, it's, it's not it's not too common, thankfully, is what I can say from my perspective. But like, again, it's it just happens sometimes, you know, sometimes as people just are not susceptible to change. But again, you'll see you'll probably see a common trend. It won't just be you. If you do a bit of homework, I'm sure if there's people before you in the business or people after you in the business, they're going to have the same problem as well. If they do have aspirations to change or aspirations to, to learn new stuff. But there's very there's very little companies I've ever worked with, there's very little people I've worked with that have ever come to me, even in my own business. People who work with my team, people who work with me and say, I want to go and learn this to, so we can improve this, or I want to go and learn a new skill that I think will help our business over the next 12 months. It's like, cool, great, yeah, that's that sounds brilliant. You're going to increase productivity. How, why would I not want that? So it's just a case that you have to put it put the proposal the right way as well. And sometimes if the person's like talking to a brick wall, go around, go around the wall instead of trying to go over it as well. Oh, no, blow it up. That's my approach. <laughs> Try right into it. Got yeah. enough jelly tonight. It'll go away. Um, anyway, but uh, it, what, are you, what I would... Are you in the raw piece? <laughs> <laughs> um, what I would also caution you, though, Sharon, is that uh, when you come up with the idea and you present it, they're going to say, well, great. Show me one organization that's done it. And as soon as you start... This, you have to be careful that you don't find yourself in a position of that you're playing bring me a rock where, where, where the manager says, well, gee, we've, you know, I need an example. You know, this is a radically new idea. Can you give me some examples of companies that have done it? And so you give them three or four and they go, well, yeah, but none of them are really in our industry. They're all different. Or my favorite version uh, working in the States was, well, yeah, but like this company's in Canada, this one's over in, in the Netherlands, this one's in France. They're not the same as us. It's like, really? They're more the same than you realize. Um, and, and so just be cautious when, 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 when the manager says, I need an example, that, that you don't find yourself spinning your wheels and getting more depressed. Okay. Okay. Now, um, Patrick, this is your show. But uh, there's one question that popped up in the Q&A window. Yeah, yeah, we can do one last one, and then we'll finish up. Then we're we bit over, but sure, nobody has anywhere to go or any commute home, do they? So let's fire yeah. the, the last one, and then we can go from there. Okay, so here we go. Um, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you found it entertaining. Uh, hopefully you learned something. Yes, management support is absolutely important. Um, without that, you're not going to get anywhere, as Sharon was, was alluding to. Um, is it worth the effort to try and make the change if the C-level bosses aren't willing to consider it? Well, that goes back to Patrick's answer, I think. And that part of that is, is, is here are the things that I think can be impacted, right? And in the three boxes that Patrick mentioned, if you can check one of those or two of those, better two, then, and they're still not willing to listen, then not to put too fine a point on it. I've said it before, find a new boss. Um, I don't have any better advice than that because if they're not willing to listen, if they're, if they are set in their ways, then they are not going to be open to anything that, that an underling might suggest. There. Am I being overly negative, Patrick? No, it's very similar to Sharon's question as well, because it could, this could be even just one idea as well. Like it's a re really relevant question, because as Sharon was saying, if you come to your boss with one proposal that you want to change over the next, say, 6, 12 months, and if they're completely against that, you have to fight a war just to get that one alone, 
you're probably not going to bother your arse trying to think of any new ideas in six, 12 months time again, because you don't really want another all out war, another campaign to get it. Like ideally you want your manager to go, Oh, that sounds great. As you said, show me a proposal. That's, that's a very fair answer or show me where it works or give me an example. If so long as they're susceptible, like, and I said, there's not many managers I know, but none of I work with, thankfully, that if I went to them and even myself, I'm going to ask them for questions in my company, if I went to my directors in the UK and asked them a question, they're very open to change. And like I do stuff very awkward, even in my job. And thankfully, my company backs me because I'll say, OK, cool, I want budget to do this. I want to go to Poland this year. I want to go do a meetup, I want to do a webinar, whatever it is. Whenever I ask for budget, they're always like, yeah, cool. How are we going to make money off it? Or where's it work before? Like literally two simple questions. As long as I can answer them, it's like, cool, there's your check. So it's, uh, it's, having, it's having a place where you can actually feel that you can go and knock on the door and say, look, I have some proposals that will help change. And again, you're, you're doing it for the good of the business and yourself. There's two things. Obviously, you want your personal growth. You want to improve your skill set to make yourself as attractive as possible in the future. And also, you're going to give yourself a lot more job satisfaction if you're good at what you do. But secondly, you're going to feel like, and people, people don't always say it, but everyone likes a little pat on the back and everyone likes the kudos they get when they do a good job. Even if it's a simple, well done from your boss or an email or whatever it is, having a boss that's actually approachable and is susceptible to that change is important. And it ties back to your talk. And even the other week when Darren and Gus did the AMA as well on, on, on their webinar as well, like a lot of the stuff they're saying is like, you need to work for people that are open to this change as well. Because if you have that mindset, you want to work with like-minded people who can see the benefit of what you're doing. And like, it's, it goes to this, it's, it's seven o'clock in the evening and there's 50 people sitting on a webinar when they don't have to be here. All these 50 people here are here because they're trying to either learn something new, pick up a few tips, or just, you know, improve their skills there and make new connections and testing as well. Nobody's forcing these 50 people to be here and their 50 managers probably aren't here. So it's a case of you want to, you want to get people to work for you. If you're hiring, you want people to work for you who are open to change and who are looking to do more stuff. If you're working for someone, you want the boss when you sit down for an interview or when you go and work for them, that if you go to them with a proposal that's going to increase productivity or make you happier, or make you more skilled in your job, they're going to back you to the hilt. They're not going to try and throw blockers in the way and say, no, this is how we do it and this is the only way we do it because that's the shittest answer you can get. This is how I do it and this is how it is. You need, you need, you need a boss who's going to be able to you know, encourage you to grow as well because there's no point just being stagnant your whole career is going through. And that's pretty much my part on it, but there's, you can so, talk about it for days. Well, yeah. you know, Patrick, keeping strong emotions in could be bad for your mental health. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> oh, there's no worries to me. Don't worry. I'm, I can, if, if I have something to say, I think everyone knows I'll say it anyway. There's no worries there, but it's just, just sick. Yeah. yeah. No, it's literally just work. work. If, you're, if, you're going to job and you're, if you're going to a job and you're not enjoying it, that's the first thing. You know, you need to enjoy your work. But again, as I said, there's, there's 50 people here on, after probably working today or work at home, whatever you're doing at home, like, I've actually bothered to come and sit in a webinar for an hour and a half and learn something new when they don't have to, when the weather's great. So there's 50 people that I'd be interested in, in, in working with in the future. You know, that's the kind of people you want. Is they're people that are open to change and learn, learning new tips to change as well. Yeah. Or maybe they're just, or as two people messaged me this morning, maybe they're all just uh, attracted by the clickbait title, testing, testing is dead. <laughs> the good title as well. But uh, that's probably a good place to leave it, I'd say. Uh, thanks a million, Pete. Really, really good talk. I think everyone will agree that was very interesting, very enthusiastic, which is which is always nice as well. It's nice to have a bit of passion in it as well, and a bit of it causes debate, and we can see by the amount of questions that dropped in the Q and A box. Probably the most we've had. The I'd say that's it's a very positive sign as well. Uh, we're probably going to go ahead towards the end of June again. I think the online webinars are going to continue a bit longer uh, due to the lovely restrictions we have. But things <laughs> things are getting a lot better. Things are improving. The death rate's down, restrictions are coming down, and things are starting to look up a bit for the whole country, which is brilliant. But uh, we'll keep the webinars going for a while, so I don't see the face-to-face -face meetings coming in anytime soon in the next month or two. But uh, so long as people still want to listen to stuff, we'll put topics there. Again, if you have anything you want to hear, whether you want to present or whether you want to hear about a certain topic or a certain uh, scenario, just get in touch with Darren or I, and we'll find somebody to do the talk. There's plenty of people we have worldwide, and we can get anyone in. If there's a particular topic you want to hear about, we'll find it. But uh, that's pretty much it, uh, Pete. Massive thanks. We'll hopefully see you next time you're in Ireland when the restrictions are down or next time you're <laughs> at all. Thanks so much, Pete. Yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. It's a pleasure. And, uh, Thank you. I'm sure if one of anyone has a follow-up, you can find Pete on LinkedIn or and he's very open and he'll happy to have a chat with anyone. I'm sure he likes talking as you can tell. His, like, blogs, his, blogs are, his blogs are fantastic as well. I've been, I've been reading them for years and years at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> So we put a, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put a post on LinkedIn tomorrow just with a, a link to the recording of this video as well and I'll put a link up to your blog if that's okay, Pete, tomorrow and just uh, a LinkedIn post if anyone else wants to 
follow her yep. back there after that degree as well. Okay, cool. Thanks, everyone. Stay okay. safe. Uh, we'll see you in a few weeks' time, okay? Bye. Thank you all. Take Take care. Care. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Darren.